In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am uh, very grateful to God that gave us this opportunity to meet again. And especially in the eve of Eid al-Fitr. Uh, we talked about ego already in the previous session. And I benefited from your presentations. This time, I am trying to suggest few techniques or few principles. Some of them are not very practical, but uh, some of them are maybe more practical. How we can uh, work on uh, facing and fighting our ego. Something which I think is the key step is to acknowledge that we have such problem as ego because unfortunately there are some people who see nothing wrong in doing what they want and you know acting as they wish and you know they feel that's actually what we are supposed to be and the culture of liberalism also you know promotes that sometimes you speak with you know some youngsters and they say, you know, why you did this? That I wanted. I just did what I wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't think there is any spirituality in the world that can suggest you can do whatever you like and still remain a, a true a spiritual human being. It's, there is no way to do whatever you like, you know. Uh, even I don't think animals do whatever <laughs> they like it, by instinct, you know. They are more uh, in a kind of understanding of what they are supposed to do, what they are not supposed to do. Uh, so we have to accept that there is such a problem. When it comes to Islamic spirituality, and I think the same should be about Christian spirituality, but I am not expert on Christian spirituality, so I don't dare saying anything about Christian spirituality. But as much as I know, and I have been hearing, I think, uh, especially the focus on you know poverty and spiritual poverty, uh, is that this is actually one of the most fundamental aspects of our spirituality. It's not just on the margin that we have to make sure that we are not driven by our own personal desires. We are driven by our love for God. We are driven by our uh, selfless desires, not selfish desires. So this is a big question in Islamic spirituality. Even as I told in the last session, uh, some people have even used the term, you have to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense of suicide, in the sense of like an animal, wild animal that has attacked you and you have to kill that animal to liberate yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to kill your animal self uh, to liberate your human and godly self. So they very much use this concept of <coughs> killing uh, because uh, it's not enough to weaken it. If you weaken it, but you leave it there, after some time, again becomes powerful. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in our previous sessions. Uh, Rumi has a story that one person in winter going back home, found a snake which was uh, frozen and looked like dead, like a piece of wood, you know, like a stick. So it's good, it's a stick, but it's a snake. You know. So took it home and left it there. But because it was warm inside the room, then little by little this was you know revived and energized and then attacked to 
bite him. So Rumi says, Nafs chun ejdehast, kei murde ast, az gham bi alati afsurde ast. He says, your soul, your, uh, you know, means your um, unethical soul is like a dragon, a snake, that because of having no means is now just, uh, you know, in a passive mood. But it's not dead. Don't think it's dead. when the means are there so for example many of us are okay because we don't have power if we have power then we are different many times we see for example people who are in opposition people even for freedom have gone to prison but when they come to power they repeat the same thing then they put other people in prison <laughs> Uh, they were asking for freedom. Now they have freedom, but they don't want to give freedom to other people. Uh, why? It's not that they were not honestly asking for freedom. Yes, at that time they were honestly asking for freedom. But at that time their nafs didn't have the means. Now they have this power. Now their other side, you know, other face is coming to the front. Or sometimes we don't have money. But if you have money, for example, then we may start using the uh, money in excess or, you know, things like this. So, <clears throat> we have to acknowledge that this is a very, very big problem. And what we understand from Islamic uh, sources is that things can gradually be sorted out. So if, say, ego has, you know, 10, 20, 30 branches, little by little you can cut these branches. But the very last branch of ego is what we call حُبُّ jah. آخر ما يخرج من قلوب الصديقين حب الجاه. The very last thing that goes out of the heart of the most truthful people is the love for position. Love, not a position in the sense of being a manager, it means you want to have a position in the society. You want to have a special regard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier to uh, say, okay, money is not important. Or, you know, to be a manager, for example, or director is not important, you know. Uh, but the very last thing is everyone wants to be very special and wants to have maximum attention of people, which is not bad as such, because this is a way for humanity to grow. And if someone is careless about, you know, his respect, it's not good. Islamically, it's very bad. If someone is careless about what people say about him, what people do to him, you know, this is not a good thing. But at the same time, it's very important that why you want respect for yourself. This is a very uh, delicate issue. You know, do I want respect for myself because of selfish reasons or do I want respect for myself because I also belong to God? And I am better able to serve God if I have respect. Many times we uh, cover the first by saying that we are doing this for the sake of God. Yeah. <laughs> but indeed, we are using God as a kind of excuse to call people to respect us because of myself. So, what should we do? First, acknowledging that this is a big problem and it is something which has different levels, different branches. It's not very easy. It is something that I think up to the last moment of our life we would be busy with. You cannot retire from this. <laughs> and you cannot graduate from this. It goes to different levels. Maybe for some months you feel 
you have managed to overcome. But this is because things have been fixed. If new things happen, you see, no, still you have problems. Or maybe you have managed to overcome your ego with your focolarina, you know, roommate or, <laughs> or homemates, but then we go outside, you know, or with my, you know, Shia, for example, you know, colleagues. But if I meet other people, you know, so it's not easy to say uh, we have finished everything and nothing is left. Therefore, another thing that we have is we have to be suspicious about ourselves. One problem is that people normally become suspicious about other people, which is not good. And the Quran says, Ejtanibu kathiran minavvan. You must avoid most of suspicion. Because some of them are sins. And because some are sins, so you have to avoid most of them. But as much as being suspicious about other people is bad, being suspicious about yourself is good. We so much love ourselves that there is a great chance that we cannot see our problems. Yeah? <laughs> You know, if you go by statistics, how many people, when they have problem with someone else, they can see that problem is caused by them? <laughs> I don't think it's even one in thousand. Even if it was one in thousand, we were very fortunate. Mm -hmm. It's maybe one in million that people admit that they have caused the problem. Sometimes I say to people that when was the last time you admitted that you made mistake? You wrong someone. If I ask you or anyone, then you have to think, okay, some people are lucky. They say, no, was just before coming here. <laughs> some people have to think, say, oh, last week. Some people say, no, last year. Some people say, no, a few years ago, I had an issue with my wife. You know, I admitted. So, does it mean that everything else, you were right, and just in that case you were wrong? Or it means that there were many, many cases that you were wrong, but you didn't admit. Or even you didn't come to know. Because we so much love ourselves. You know, uh, we say this, that When you love something a lot, it makes you blind. Yeah, so and because we love ourselves so much that we cannot see problems in ourselves, it's much easier to see problems in other people. So the only way to make sure that you are able to see your problems is first to be suspicious about yourself and second to seek help from other people who can objectively look at you. They should be kind but not biased, so that they cover your sins. You know, you're perfect. You know. I wish we had more people like you. <laughs> no, they have to be honest and, you know, tell us, you know, what problems we have. But, of course, not in a bad way that causes, you know, injury or pain more than needed. So, to be accepting that this is a is big issue, to be suspicious about ourselves, not to go after our desires is very important. So if I am not comfortable with something, <coughs> maybe actually that is where I have to try not being comfortable. You know? This is part of fight against ego. For example, we are few people, we travel. And then every two people should share room. Among them, I am more happy with this friend, for example. Not that friend. But actually, it's better that I say no. Now I want to stay with this friend. Because this is the one that I don't like that much. <laughs> yeah? And many times, you know, your idea will change. Because many times we have not given people any try. You know, we haven't tried them, you know, to give them a chance, you know, to show themselves. One of the beauties of traveling together is you can better see people. There is a, something that our first Imam says about 
a brother in God that he had. And commentators have different opinions whom he is referring to. Some say he refers to the Prophet. Some say he refers maybe to Abu Dhar, a companion of the Prophet. We are not 100% sure. But the description is something that can be prescription. He says, it starts like this. This is in Nahj al-Balag. Kana li fi ma mada akhun fillah. In the past, I had a brother in God. So it shows that that person has, by that time, died. And he says beautiful things about that person. I mentioned some of them. Kana kharijan min sultan batneh. He was free from control of his stomach in the sense that animal desires were not ruling him. So he was not wishing or desiring for something that was not available. Yeah, Many times we want things which are not available. And if it was available, he was not doing in excess. So sometimes I'm not happy with the food that I have. Sometimes I have it and do lots, you know, eat a lot. Both is problem. You should be content with what is available and use it you know, reasonably. Food is just one example. There's lots of other appetites that we have. وَكَانَ أَكْثَرَ دَهْرِهِ صَامِتَ Most of his life he was silent. Because speaking too much is not good unless there is a reason. For example, you are a teacher or you, are, you know, maybe. But in your personal life, it's good not to speak too much. But فَإِنْ قَالَهِ But whenever he talked, he was benefiting and he was over other speakers. So he spoke very little, but his wisdom and knowledge were, you know, coming out. He was, you know, like quenching the thirst of people who ask questions. He looked a very weak person. You know, because sometimes people understand your humility as a sign of weakness. You know, there are people that unless you act as an arrogant person, they think you are weak. And they misunderstand, you know, humility. But these people don't stop being hum you know, humble because other people don't you know, understand. They remain humble. But he says, when the time of seriousness comes, فَإِنْجَا الجد فَهُوَ لَيْثُ غَابٍ but when it was the time of challenge, he was like a lion. So in normal life, he was like a weak person. But when the time of challenge, he was insisting and, you know, persistent. Then he mentions other qualities, like, for example, he was never blaming someone. As long as there was a chance to find excuse for that person. So you should look for excuse for people, not just wait for them to bring it. The main quality that I want to focus on is this one. Wakana idha badahahu amran. When two things are now possible there is a choice to make there are two possibilities then he was looking which of these two are more is more likely to be the one that he personally desires he has a you know egoistic interest in this and then doing the opposite Many times we see which one we have more interest and then we do it. But 
the people who have control over their you know <laughs> desires so this is a big step for fighting our ego and sometimes actually uh, in the beginning for example people uh, find it for example should i go to the church or not if i don't go to church it's better you know i am relaxed no. so you have to go to the church yeah so if, Initially, it's easy between going to the church or watching the TV, you know. Mm -hmm. But little by little, it becomes very complicated. So it can be, for example, uh, going to the church or helping, for example, someone who is ill, for example, going to the mosque or, you know. Of course, uh, we don't want to stop going to the mosque or church, but you have to understand. Uh, uh, one example in Com, you know, came to my mind when I was, you know, driving. I said, okay, suppose I am going to reach quickly to the shrine to say my prayer, you know, in shrine. You know, it's great blessing if you can go and say your prayer in the shrine, you know, in the especially congregational prayer in the shrine. But then I see someone on the road, you know, need uh, needs lift. In here, it's not common that... Uh, other than taxis and Uber, you know, people ask for. But in Iran, uh, every car can give you a lift. Many times uh, people do it freely or sometimes, you know, they do it as a little job. So, but many times people do it. So you can be a, a scholar, but you give lift to someone, you know, and you don't, of course, take anything. So I was thinking, okay, I am going to the shrine and I am going to be delayed and miss the prayer if I want to give lift, for example, to a person. But on the other hand, you don't know. Maybe actually giving lift to this person right now, under rain, for example, is more pleasing to God than going there. I'm not saying always, but I'm saying at least you have to be open to consider this, that sometime maybe what you have you know targeted and you know focus your mind on that i have to go and reach there and maybe sometimes something comes on the side which is actually a better opportunity for you to please god so in such cases one way to understand is to see which one is the one that you might egoistically not like and for a religious person there is a great chance that egoistically he may want to go to do that religious task. Mm -hmm. Not for ordinary people. Ordinary people, religion is still is not that important for them. But for religious people, you know, sometimes this becomes the egoistic side. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's very complicated. It's not something easy. So, another thing is that you cannot, I think, uh, fight against your ego in vacuum 90 percent of problems with ego comes when we live with each other yeah so if someone is in a cave just 10 percent of ego can get on his way you know when you are alone okay for example you know you wake up you know do this practice do this that you know don't damage for example you know animal do it's just 10 percent or maybe even one percent 90% of ego comes between us when we are together. Uh, between you and God, you know, there is no chance of your ego that much coming out. But between you and people. So now we have to learn how to tackle our ego among ourselves. And here, patience is very important. And, you know, many times... Uh, I think we have this great tendency towards solving problems. Yeah? But unfortunately, it seems that for spiritual issues, sometimes to admit that you have to keep this injury, <laughs> you know, in physical injury, you say, okay, doctor, you know, please help me. And sometimes say there is cure, sometimes there is no cure, we have to cut off. But in a spiritual problem, sometimes all your life you have to remain with this injury or with this relation. You know, always you cannot say, okay, I don't want to see you anymore. 
the people that we have to live with them inside family, I don't know, community, they keep annoying you. And of course, maybe you are also annoying them. <laughs> but there is no cure. Even you cannot say, we disconnect and we finish everything. No. We have to be patient. You know, sometimes uh, I was thinking, if there are people who are not, uh, you know, I'm not happy with them working together. I was thinking, you know, why I cannot, like any other manager, say, you know, I don't want, you know, you to come here. And, you know, this is, for example, you're right and finish. I said, why I keep myself, you know, so much in pain, you know, uh, I can finish this. But then I said, maybe this is your selfishness. Who are you to seek peace of mind? Why you want peace of mind? Maybe you have to have no peace of mind. Maybe you have to be a manager who has no peace of mind. So, <laughs> you know, it's a very complicated thing. So we have to be patient. And one of the things that I think helps a lot is to be able to forgive people who wrong us. Your ego find it very difficult to pray for people that have wronged you. Mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago, someone said something interesting. You know, we, uh, we have a re recommended prayer. We call it uh, Salatul Layl. So this is not uh, obligatory, but it's highly recommended. It's before dawn. So after midnight, before dawn, uh, we should say uh, this prayer. And in the last unit, you ask, uh, it's recommended again, uh, ask from God forgiveness for 40 people. Most of people, what they do, which is also maybe advisable, is they choose 40 most pious people and ask God for forgiveness for them. Or uh, they include their teachers, their parents, you know, which is very good. But someone was saying something that was also good. I say maybe we can do both, make, make 40, 80. <laughs> he was saying, I should not ask forgiveness for 40 people who are very pious. I should ask forgiveness for 40 people who have annoyed me <laughs> and have been hurting me. <laughs> because if I ask, you know, God, you know, please forgive my father, mother, grandfather, you know, or this creative scholar. Okay, it's good, but it doesn't have that transformative power that when you pray for the people that you are really angry with them. In any case, I always think praying for people that have wronged you is a kind of medicine actually for yourself. Because immediately raises your level to a higher level that you feel they are no longer a threat to you. Yeah, because when I am in a position, it means that I am able to treat them with mercy and kindness. This means that I am, you know, in a higher position than being just fighting. So praying for them, forgiving them, and patience. I think these are three important things that we have to observe. And if we have these three Hopefully, we can gain a quality which we discussed before, fairness. Because fairness is quite opposite to ego. Fairness means that between you and someone else, you don't take your own side. Ego means you take always your side. And we talked about this fairness in the past. So these are a few points, maybe not very practical uh, in a detailed way, but I hope they are useful. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Thank you.